Job for our next session, which is titled Obliv, where translators Sudhishna Mohanty and Sudhanshu Mohanty uh, will be in conversation and discuss their latest book. The book has just been released. Uh, we are actually carrying the first copies with us today, and it's available at the bookstore. So we hope our conversation can encourage you uh, to go and get your copies. Uh, brief introductions about our speakers while we set the stage up. Uh, Sudeshna Mohanty is an alumnus of Miranda House, Delhi University. She taught English for over 30 years in an affiliated college of Bangalore University and retired as an associate professor in December 2017. Her translation includes an anthology, Hidden Ganga and Other Stories, and Short Stories and the Tide Turned in the Frontline, and more recently, Unending in Muse India. Good afternoon once again and thank you to both of you for joining us here today to discuss this very special translation and as I mentioned we've also just seen the books today and they're available at the bookstore so you can grab your copies. Before we head into the discussion and you know get into the specifics of the translation, uh, let us talk about the man, you know Gopinath Mohanty. Uh, how would you describe him to somebody who has not read him before or somebody who doesn't know that much about him. So how would the both of you, you know, set him up for the audiences, so as to say? Good afternoon to everyone. And uh, so much thanks to the Tata Steel Literary Meet here. I, I think I'm cornered in the sense that Pratit is asking me a question which I say something more, it's going to be panegyric. If I say something less, it's going to be inadequate. I really don't know how exactly to get off. Uh, I think, uh, I will put it this way, the way I think best, that one is, he was a magical writer. When I say magical, having read actually almost 100 of his stories in Odia, that's a source language. And uh, beyond that, maybe about 20 odd stories in English, which uh, I had also been involved in translation of one. I would say that uh, it is very difficult to typecast him. But one thing is the common denominator there, that is his lyrical elegiac prose, unmistakably. I mean, whichever, whatever stories that you take up, this is very clearly apparent. And so far as, uh, I mean, we don't claim to be any authority on Oriya literature. And if you read the book, I think we have started with a very frank confession. That is the reason, uh, instead of the preface, we have followed a very different approach. We called it the way it happened, this book. Well, I think I'm answering this question first, when truly it should have been Sudeshna who should have been answering the question. But since she looked at me, I thought that's a nod for me to go ahead. Uh, I think she's the one who initiated the whole thing. And she made a request to me. She lives in Bangalore, I also live in Bangalore. Except the fact that we are 25 or 24 kilometers apart from each other. And I think all the people here would be aware of the Bangalore traffic. So that brings the curtain in turning up at each other's place. But she did. And she handed over a book of hers which she had published, which I think Pratiti mentioned about Hidden Ganga and other stories. And when she came up, she said that, Sudhanshu, you go through this book. Don't give me all those uh, stereotypical answers that friends generally provide, which is, oh, it's a good book. I mean, it's a good book. I found it fine. You tell me, you give me an honest assessment of the book. 
that triggered a few thinking in my my head i said well i mean my experience of odia writers and writings has been very different that if i express some some reservations about it even in the most politest terms they would say oh that means you didn't like it i said that is a it's not a it's not a binary it's not black and white it could be different shades all i'm suggesting is that this story could have been improved upon in a particular way possibly and these are very constructive healthy not criticism suggestions but i found that sudeshna was open to all this idea so i wrote back a very detailed email and sent it across to her she asked me that whether would you like to join me in my next project i said okay i'll take a look not join me sorry it's my mistake i'll be i'll i'll seek your help and would you like to do it i said okay i'll do it so she started sending me books sorry stories across and it grew and in her words she says that she wanted someone to validate her work and she thought that i could be the right person what she didn't know is that i was not only the wrong person possibly i was the wrongest person my experience of translation goes back to the 1990s i translated one book called three mariners published by harper collins then i we published three of my three of us friends we published a very definitive book called the harper collins book of oriya short stories but it was actually my friend kk mahapatra who in odia writes as kamala kanta mahapatra a fabulous creative writer and equally as good as a translator who was the inspiration and the source he is the one who translated from odia to english i think we kind of garnished and embellished it i mean he me and my and my his wife leela vati so i don't say that i did much in terms of translation from odia to english it was as i said about garnishing it embellishing it the english language with three of us put our heads together it was a tough task and that was the end of it so when shudeshna came to me i laughed not on her face but i laughed inside and i said this is tough then the rest of the part i think you'll get to read, get to read in the book that we have mentioned like i mentioned before about the way it happened this book very honest account how the book proceeded we had plenty of self doubts gopinath mahanti is not easy to translate he uses lot of colloquial words lot of patwa and uh, his uh, his environment that he tries to capture can range from the most banal to the most uh, intricate imageries that we can see in the book why we translated these 20 stories i think our focus was on translating stories of gopinath mahanti which have not been translated by anyone to our knowledge and uh, midway of course she asked me that would you like to join me and such was a dedication to the book such was a commitment i without hesitation i agreed and it took us a whole 3 years i think uh, our book was kind of co terminus with the covid 19 so i think i'll i'll stop here i'll hand over for sudeshna because it's getting monotonous at the ways thank you yeah uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you for having me here Uh, Sudang Sur spoke about uh, Gopinath Mahanti's works, and he told us why we took it up. Uh, he spoke about the lyrical quality of his prose. Uh, to that, I would just like to add a little bit and say that what fascinated me about the stories was the wide range of characters that he uh, talks about in the stories, uh, characters which we can relate to even today, and his vivid attention to detail. 
when he's describing a person or a place. Uh, like he said, all this was a little difficult to handle. Uh, but uh, we reviewed the stories, we passed it across back and forth a number of times and uh, finally produced this. So it's for the readers to say whether we've done a good job or not. Uh, but why did you think that you needed a, you know, somebody to say validate or a co-creator in this process? You know, yes. you had begun doing it on your own but somewhere in the middle you thought you needed somebody else. So if you can yeah, talk that's us That's a good through. question. Uh, I, I was very new to translation. I hadn't done any kind of uh, activity like this, though translating was always at the back of my mind. Then when I retired from the teaching job that I was doing in uh, the year 2017, my daughter too got married and uh, I was in an empty nest. I had to do something to line the nest. And uh, I decided to go back to this something and translate it into, into a concrete project. I did a few stories, uh, but um, then I thought always a second opinion is better than one. I had read some of his works. I had met him a very few number of times. But then I had liked what he wrote. I had liked the book that he had. I had gone through the, the HarperCollins book of short stories. So, and I was looking to better myself. So that was the best choice that came up, the best option in front of me. Ask him if he will join you and then you'll do better. So, so how did you think that this was a good choice for you to make when you got this offer, that, you know, <laughs> offer <laughs> of validation? I mean, if you, you want a honest answer or a diplomatic answer? Always the honest one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'll say that uh, her dedication, I think I was hinting, I had almost come to this particular point. I have an issue, although, I mean, uh, Odia is a Matru Bhasa. I think both of us, we had a nodding acquaintance with Matru Bhasa. We were completely taken up with the Pitru Bhasa, which I say English. But a Matru Bhasa never became a Satru Bhasa. It remained Matru Bhasa all along. I mean, maybe we were inadequate, we couldn't come up to this. But what drew me to this, and it is a fact that after HarperCollins book came out, there are many people from Orissa who contacted me, us rather, to translate their stories and all. I said it's a too tough a job. And I have very honestly mentioned, and since you asked this question to be answered honestly, I'll say that translation can be creative in terms of language and words, but it shrinks creative space. Your wings are there, but you can't really fly afar. And I took it up because two things. I think her dedication, which possibly no one could have nudged me ever to do it, even at the point of a gun. Putting a gun to my head also, I wouldn't have taken it up. And the second is her humility, which is striking and which I want to emphasize in a place like Odessa, when everyone talks about, uh, I, I, I do mention, I'm going to mention, I've already mentioned in my book that I'm working on, on Katak, a quirky me moir, not memoir, but me moir. It's all first person pronouns, I, me, mine. She had nothing to pervade to me, nothing, not even a whisper, forget about a word. That drew me in. I said, I'm going to do it with her. Uh, so, Desha mentions that, you know, uh, Gopinath Mohanty's, you know, persona as a novelist was always well known, you know, but his uh, short stories or his uh, identity as a short story writer was not that well known. So, why do you both think that is? Because, you know, as a novelist, he was so popular, the first uh, award winner of the Sahitya Academy, you know, first ever winner. So, why do you think that is, that his short stories are not as well known as his novels? Uh. Again, if you want to, uh, uh, you're asking me for Always an honest the answer. Honest one. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I think there are two stories I need to highlight here, which I thought I could speak at, at a greater length later, but let me answer this. This first story, which was written in 1935 36, when he was just about 21 or 22 max, you can say 21 still an undergraduate in Ravenshire College and this was published in the East Hostel magazine. 
had not really come out from the coal mines for, I mean, Canary in the coal mines, that kind of a thing I'm, I'm alluding to. <coughs> and uh, I think it's, it has not been published. It was very hard to retrieve, but we got it. And very surprisingly, I found that why this particular story has not come out in translation. And I thought that uh, not only the story content, its relevance for that point in time, which is about 90 years ago, 90 years. Imagine the, when you look at the story, you look at the ecosystem then prevailing there. And uh, I said, and the style of the story, cryptic, laconic, I mean, a typical thing which I love of, uh, if you have read uh, Krishna Sopti's books and all, that style was, is something that I adored. His subsequent stories, what has happened is, they have become very long. It is more like a kind of a mini novella. And some of the stories have clicked. And some others, I think, all these years that his stories have been translated, which goes back to about 40, 50 years. I think no one wanted actually to pick up these stories. And uh, we thought some stories can still have a relevance even 40, 50, 60, 70. This is a vast conspectus about 55 years. From 35 till about 88, say about 80, for 53 years the stories, the range, the entire conspectus of the stories. But uh, uh, I really can't answer that why it has not been done. The one thing that I can only surmise is that possibly uh, that people who saw the translators were then there. I mean, I'm talking about the 70s or 80s and all that. They were getting started and they thought that a novel is a better option for them to translate. Because when you translate, if you really want to go over to the mainstream publishers, <coughs> it, it does need to convey some meaning, some sense, some direction. And they, they were, maybe the, it's, it's, I can't say that whether it's a, it was a work in progress, or work in the head, or thoughts in the head. But a few of the stories are very riveting. There are, like it's easy for one to say whether the stories are completely, absolutely perfect. I wouldn't hazard that kind of a thing. I think every writer, if you pick up a book and all that, you can find flaws here and there. It's nothing unusual. Uh, I really can't answer, provide an answer, but I can give you a background. And at a later stage, I can read out uh, some sentence. Oh, I'll do it now itself. So the people get a sense of why I'm, I'm, I'm plugging for this. Which is the last 25. I'll read the, the, uh, the last part. I won't take much of your time, maybe just about two minutes. This is what, Da is a poily. And poily, let me go back to what we have written in the, at the beginning as a small note in the... Da is Gopinath Mahathir's first short story, written in the early 1930s, when he was an undergraduate at Ravanshir College, Katak. It was published in the college's East Hostel magazine. Da is a sensitive portrayal of the character of a poily, a concubine. In feudal, hidebound Orissa of the early 20th century, Taking a poili was a common practice among rich, high caste zamindar. As heinous as this practice was, it seemed to carry no social stigma or moral taint. Poilis were abased to shackles in a male dominated society. Women had no voice in such polygenous practices. The story raises this nuanced societal issue. How dare Don, a poily, talk about Molly, a legitimate member of the family? And how ironic it is that the roles are reversed. The age-old haunting tale of Don, also called Domi and Sari, 
morphs into the frisson of youth in Mali and Sotia. Then I'll come back to the last uh, part and say why I, I like the story and why we thought that this is absolutely worth translating. <coughs> This is the last part where Don is being banished from the home because of exposing about uh, a picadillo between uh, her, um, I mean, paramour then, uh, her paramour's granddaughter and with another waif. This reads like this, quote, waste, waste, waste. This life has been a waste. God, God is a curse. God is a block of stone. God is this blow, God is this rejection, God is this debasement, God is this pitch darkness, all this dust. Dawn shudders as she gets up. This is her last plaint against creation and the creator. A step forward and then another and still more. Images from the past flash across her mind as she walks towards the river. The orchard, gathering leaves, the smiling sade, the ecstasy of youthful flesh that had once set her on fire, the banal daily chords, the missing rice seeds, the abuses and curses, Malli and Sotia entwined much as Daw and Sade once were, decades ago, only the memories hold now. The good, the bad, the ugly and the sad, a whole cocktail of them. They tunnel into a head. They stay, hegemonizing her thoughts and refusing to go away. They shall always remain with her, always within her, in this life or any other. In the two-pronged river, a loud splash. Midstream, everything disintegrates, melts. The water of the river surges over the embankment and eats into the soil. It has done so in many places along its path. Silence all around. Only the scrawny dog <coughs> sits on its haunches and beats its tail five times on the ground before emitting a heart-rending howl. Whoa, oh. Thank you. A round of applause for that beautiful translation, please. Thank you. Uh, he mentioned that briefly that these stories were written many, many years ago. So when you're choosing this and translating this, that is also in a language which is not, the language has also evolved over the years. And when you're writing in, say, sitting in 2020, you know, 2020 during the pandemic. So how do you sort of, uh, you know, take that language but modernize it, but try to keep the original essence in it? So I would like to ask you this question. Yeah, like you uh, said just now, these are stories are written about over more than 50 years. And uh, when we got down to translating it, our focus was to try to retain as much of the original, the lyricism of the original as possible. So uh, we played around with words and because we are familiar with the modern uh, vocabulary, words that are in use today, we use those words. But uh, sometimes what we've done is to try to retain the local flavor, we have used Odia words with the meaning within uh, commerce. We have also retained uh, relationship terms. We have also retained uh, uh, the names of uh, festivals and seasons. And most importantly, what we've done with the proverbs. A proverb in Odia would have a particularly typical valid English translation, but we have not used the English translation. Or if we have, we have translated the proverb in English and then given the English translation. There's in the story called Town Bus, um, the, it talks about a girl uh, and says that say, kutta khandu ku dikhanda kari pareni. So we have translated that, saying that she couldn't break a straw in two. And after that, we have given the English proverb, she was a good for nothing. The same thing we've done with all the proverbs, sometimes retaining the English translation, but we have not replaced it 
with the, an English proverb. So that's how we have tried to retain interjections, ma lo, and um, uh, lots of interjections like kilo, this, kilo, kilo, kilo ho. ma lo, and oh, ho. Yes, that is something so, he had yeah. mentioned so, to us. Ho is so the these one. are. So he'll talk about. He'll talk about <laughs> ho. <laughs> I think I think I, I, it just came from me. I mean, uh, 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 spontaneously, that who is possibly the 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 most favorite term of Sudeshna. I mean, she could say in WhatsApp chat and all that she could say anything in English, or for that matter, if could be anything that she wanted to say in in Odia, but she will circle back to say who. So, and I, one day I, I said, said that who has got very different connotations and if you want I'll just send it across what all things comes to my head on who itself. So many, many terms, many, many terms that we have used and uh, there, are, there are terms which uh, like uh, I read out that portion, Abhiman, it's simply untranslatable to English language or for that matter possibly any European language. Because that kind of an experience is typically in Indian, across the board, not confined to one language. It means you have something which is language. local, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's difficult to and put we, it. We have used plain there, P-L-A-I-N-T. In that particular context, we thought this is possibly the best word to use to express, express her feeling against God, the Creator. The book is called uh, Oblivion and Other Stories. So, uh, why Oblivion and why do you think that that had to be like, say, the title story, so as to say? I'll take this. Oh. Yes, Sudeshna, please. Okay, uh, so um, Oblivion is first a very beautiful story. Okay, uh, so uh, this was written way back in uh, 1941. Uh, it's a beautiful story which is, uh, uh, re is relevant even today. I, this, um, my mother was around when I first started, when I took the baby steps for translation. And this was the last story that I did with her before she passed away. So uh, we liked the story and because of this personal connection with her, I suggested to him, should we have this as the uh, title story? He agreed and therefore it is Oblivion and other stories. And how did you from this like you know, this, there's a large, large repertoire of short stories. How did you come to these 20? Was there a particular reason why you wanted to showcase these ones? Or like he mentioned, was it because there were not too many translations of these stories out there? How did you, after reading all of the stories, come down or, you know, bring it down to these, these particular ones? Yeah, our first concern when we, we curated the stories from a number of anthologies, we are not limiting ourselves to only one anthology. The first thing that we thought about, the first thing on the criteria for selecting the stories was that we would pick stories that hadn't been done earlier. The, uh, so Gopinath Mohanty has written for about, about 150 published stories, out of which only 15 have been translated many times over by different translators. Even now I was talking to someone who said, oh, he has so many short stories too, 150 short stories, that's an unbelievable number. People don't know that he also has, has so a many. corpus of short stories. So we selected first those that uh, hadn't been translated and uh, next it was our personal, we were subjective in the choice of the stories. The ones that stories you liked. Stories we liked and we thought had to be reach out to a wider readership. So those were... Those two, these two could be the main reasons for choosing the story, sir. And before we, I would request you both to read some passages, but before that, uh, any favorites? Favorites of what you, is your personal favorite story of his, and which you think after translation that, okay, I've done a good job with this one. Uh, to, this I would want both of you to answer. You first. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, my first, my one of my favorites, is Dawn, and I've already expressed, so I will not see. I, I switch over to uh, exactly the antithesis of Dawn, and I say antithesis of Dawn in the sense that it is a very long story. Uh, Chakrapani, but I'm not going to talk about here Chakrapani because I've already mentioned in the book. All I need to mention about Chakrapani it's a, it's a full-toned picture of Oriya villages 
of the 1940s. And uh, in Gopinath Mahanji's case, what happens is there is no nostalgia. Nor is there any nostalgia on our part when, you, when we rekindle that environment or atmosphere or ecosystem. But it is one which lays bare the way the society was in the 1940s and 50s. You may or may not like that kind of a society, that's a different matter because we are li living in a very digi digital age. Very but if you really from what it yeah, was when you, very if different. you really go back to this, there is almost nothing missing there. But I will not talk about that because it's I've elaborated in my in my first uh, in lieu of the, the, the way it happened this book. I think there are two other favorites if I may consider yes. uh, two more, if you permit me to. One is the paper boat. And the paper boat is again a very long story which I wish it had been shaped in the, in the light of dawn. But the way the story is written today, I mean, the way we have translated, there are many elements which are still prevalent in the Orissa that we live in, the rich and the poor. And I think Gopinath Mahanti, I mean, who that said, Kain Raj said, we, ours is a, Indian twin nation. I mean, I'm putting words in his mouth, not his words. I think there are two Indias that we have. Or there's an India, there's a Bharat. I think Gopinath Mahanti, the fact that he was an administrative officer, a member of the what is some administrative service, he obviously lived in India, but his eyes were riveted to the people in the margin in Bharat. And uh, this story is about the, the ambition, the aspiration of a poor, two poor boys, paper boat, trying to grab something when a rich woman has been drowned in the river. And they keep on running for hours on end, for miles on end, those days are miles. And finally, they got nothing. And then the realization suddenly sinks in that, well, we have found the body, but there's nothing there. But look at her, and what are we? And there's a sense of dismay. At, this, at the same time, a dismay for not getting anything at when a person is dead or dying. The other story, the, the, uh, uh, the crow and the cuckoo, that is something, uh, which I think, if we know this, in Odia we call it the cow koili. The, the, uh, the, there's an element of, uh, I mean, I think, I, think, I think still today it is prevalent. I, I keep saying that we, uh, the most loyal people that you get in the world possibly are the ones who are below our, let's say we are all middle class. Some could be middle middle class, some could be higher middle class, some could be lower middle class. And the people who are down below, they have a heart. This Koili or the cuckoo had a heart. And the two grew up, I mean the boy from a rich family, struggling because the parents are no more there. And she grows big and all. At the end of it, she is, he is dying there. And this woman, who seemingly, when she was a girl, was in love with him, it's not brought out clearly in the story. And the boy also was in love with her, but it seemed a kind of antithesis that they are, they are in love, a rich and the poor. It doesn't happen in a feudal ridden society of Orissa. Didn't happen then, doesn't happen even today. I think this is a, there's a dichotomy, but nonetheless, it's very really touchingly brings out this dichotomy of the crow and the cuckoo. Uh, so we've heard from both of them uh, a little bit about why they chose Gopinath Mohanty, why they chose these particular stories and how they went about uh, this process of translation. I think now we can request them to give us a glimpse of that if uh, Sudhanshu will read it in the original Odia and then if you could read the translation. I'll ask someone to get it for you.
What's the English? What's the English? I think we can do the Oriya and then the English to how the translation okay. yeah. I will read out from uh, a story called, uh, in Oriya it's called Lison. And uh, this is about the lyrical, let me say this as a, as a preface, that it's on the lyrical, elegiac quality of Gopirat Bhante's words in Oriya. And these are very short passages we have taken, so that when uh, Sudeshna reads the English, you would get to know how hard it was for us to translate, how authentic we were, and what deviations we have made, and what kind of a wordplay we have indulged in, not lavishly, but what we thought to be very appropriate to the occasion. And let me also preface this by saying that uh, one of the very important things which came to our mind is when you write in English, when you translate to English, your English book reaches out to a very, very wide audience. And uh, even for Oriya readers, let's say, even a person like me, if I have to read an Oriya book and if I have to read some other English books, both in English, I would look into the readability. So what we wanted actually is a book, the translation, to be very fluid, very limpid, and to be delivered in a very lapidary prose with grace and dignity. And that is precisely what we have attempted. I'll read out here. Yes. I'll read in Odia. Please don't laugh if I keep on fumbling and stumbling. I've tried to rehearse many times over last evening, to be very honest. I think we are, we are on transparency and honesty. I plugged for it. I'll just read it. Agare osaro noita hau mela hoich. Sunne sunne pita pakaile huenta dui mile. Korare disuchi sepako puru puru hoi. Kohara kora dhari ekono. Ta sepake. Haluka chairo ucha ucha deu. Kemiti minji minji heuchi. Ketebele patala rona kudi. Ghodi hoi se akasa soito, eko hoi misi jauchi, Udajaja chari de jaitiba duapuri, Ketabare se akasaro, Tati kobato, ro, akuku, tole hoi, utuchi, au bari heuchi, pardo bully, puni, auji podi, akasare, choppi jauchi. I'm jumping a few lines and going over to another part. Kola mismis osaro kopalo. This is about the person's description of his face. His name is Bissaro. Kola misimisi osaro kopalo upare kunchu kunchu chomo tini osaro hui abu abu hui roichi. Mundo balo jemiti pura bena buddha. Kohara pausia dualia. Ucha nako nako danda ba aruku tiki e bonka. Osaro or Ucha Gallo Hado or Dima Brulata Hado Majide Aki Goti Kalore Danki Huich Kodi Padi Thodi Kodi Padi Thodi Hado Kintu Takua Gallo Dahanuru Baduku Dholi Dholi Shi Karano Ba Pato Pakua Muhara Ada Sadarana Motu Botu Bodo Kintu Adata hi ochi, Ausabu chepa kalo kalo. Se jemiti gotae, be moramot puruna copperi goro. Dobichi, kujahuichi, kanturu mati, bohijaiki, sioro sioro hui, bangi sioro sudi hui, bangi podinahi. Then the last part. Kali monisonku, again the same man what he has achieved in life. Kali Morisanku Sadhya Kariva Kahani Nue Bonoro Jontu Gubi Kahani Cholutila Ketekete Sahaba Etete Bagomari Jete Foto Utile O Sohosa Tonka Puruskar Pile
ସେଥିପାଇଁ ପ୍ରକୃତରେ ସବୁ କୃତିତ୍ୱ ବିଶାଳର ମାରେ ସିପାହୀ ନାମ ସର୍ଦ୍ଦାର ସେ କୁଆଡ଼େ ତାଳି ମାରି ବାଘକୁ ଡାକେ ବାଘ ନିଶ ଫୁଲାଏ ସେ ନିଶ ମୋଡ଼େ ବାଘ ଆ କରେ ସେ ଆ କରେ ବାଘ ଗର୍ଜନ କରେ ଗର୍ଜନ ଗର୍ଜନ ଛାଡ଼େ ଆଉ ସେ ଫୁଟାଏ ବନ୍ଧୁକ ତାପରେ ବାଘ ବାଘ ଜନ୍ମରୁ ଉଦ୍ଧାର I'll read the English. The river, two miles across as the crow flies, is wide open in its expanse and flows buck naked. In the far distance is a row of undulating bleached forms, fleetingly visible in the faint shadowy light of the sun, before the flimsy fog mimicking the contrail of a passing aircraft gobbles it up. They seem like matted bamboo doors in the sky, these mountains at times bulging out, at times leaning back to disappear behind the clouds. In the monsoon, the surging waters in the river make it resemble the sea. Adikanto feels the sea breeze on his face as he stands on the edge of the stone embankment, gazing out at the vast openness of the river. Adikanto is like an old tiled house in dire need of repair, sunken in, twisted, the mud on the walls washed away in streaks, yet unbroken. A dark, wide, furrowed forehead, the hair on his head like a blighted bush, grey and blunt. A high nose tilted slightly to the left, wide and high cheekbones, protruding bushy eyebrows that hood a pair of deep-set eyes. A chin like a spade, the cheeks hollow over toothless gums. An unusually broad face, but only the size remains. Everything else has flattened and hollowed out. This is the old Adikanta. So there are stories told about Adikanta as a young man. And uh, I'll move on to the paragraph that talks about this. Stories were not only told about his feats with people, they included tales of his exploits with animals too. Legend had it, that the credit for killing the countless tigers which the numerous sahibs claimed as their trophies, the myriad photographs they clicked with the dead tigers, and the prizes they professed to have won, actually belonged to Biswal. The sepoy did the deed, the sardar stole the fame indeed. Apparently, Biswal summoned tigers by clapping at them. The man and beast looked at each other eyeball to eyeball. The tigers snorted, Biswal twirled his moustache. The tiger snarled, B Biswal guffawed. The tiger growled, Biswal pulled the trigger. And then the tiger was released from its tiger incarnation. Thank you so much. Uh, and as uh, Sudhanshu mentioned that English has a much wider reach and I was also able to read this because you translated them because I don't speak or read Odia. So thank you to both of you for translating this. Uh, before I hand it over to the audience uh, for some questions from them, uh, let me ask both of you what are the future plans? Now that this book is out into the world, what are you working on next? Uh, I would like to translate uh, the work of a living uh, writer. Uh, we've done these 20 stories and we've passed it around to many people have read it and given us uh, their perspective on it. But I would, uh, what, what I miss when doing this is the author's perspective. So I would like to take up a work by a uh, uh, living writer with whom I could uh, discuss my ideas, who could give me his feedback and uh, look at the work from his point of view. That's interesting. So, Dhanshu, what is uh, next in the works for you? I, I think the pandemic is hopefully over. <laughs> so, my translation days, for the timing at least, is over. I find it hard actually to translate. And, uh, and since Sudeshna knows it's not preposterous on my part to say that I'll get back to what I was doing in writing the, my my memoirs as a, as, a, as a clerk. I was a clerk in the government of India. I, I take this, I belong to a, a cadre called SDC, 
in line with the LDC and the UDC, lower division clerk and upper division clerk. I was in the senior division, as a senior division clerk. So I'll write because there are lots for me to write and this is something I've written before about uh, Babus, the bureaucrats, yes. my own reservations, how lack of transparency has completely, I'll say that, I mean, by and large, exceptions apart, has uh, ravished this nation. I would like to, to go back to that. And that possibly I'm aiming to be the book I wanted to write. I'm going to go back to that. But before that, maybe I've already, while doing this Oriya uh, translation from Oriya to English, on the side I've been working on, uh, uh, on Katak. Actually, Sudeshna is the one who put this matter, this thought in me. It was there before, but I think she helped me in germinating that. This is so the memoir, right? That you yes. the Katak. Yes, and memoir. maybe at some point in time I'll come back to, to translation. You. And like she mentioned about living writers and all, there have been a lot of writers who have written pellucid prose in Oriya. Pellucid prose in Oriya. I would like to get back to them. And one is my very dear friend. I make a, 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 a disclosure. Kamala Kanta Mahapatra's uh, book, uh, Janamuru Maruna, is an astounding autobiography. I put it at the top of the heap. Frank honest, self-deprecating. I mentioned about, uh, like Sudeshna being, uh, why I was, I wanted to help her, her humility, which is a kind of a rare commodity amongst the Oriya literati. And I have no hesitation to say this. I'm, I have no shrinking violet. I say this up front. And uh, she was one of the, one from the endangered species. I'll put it this way. I'll come back to that book, maybe at some point in time. And uh, many of such books, which are very illuminating. And uh, the sense of honesty is a kind of a part of my DNA. And transparency. A life should be an open book, not a book which is conjured, which is uh, manufactured your way to put you on a pedestal. No. I mean, I don't. I mean, I, I refer to a book recently I finished, maybe six, seven months back, about of uh, Amartya Sen, his, uh, uh, his autobiography, only for about 30 years, how frank he is. I mean, not a word about what he achieved. And if at all there is a word about what he didn't achieve, it is right there. That when he was given a, the Nobel Prize and his school, St. Gregory School in Dhaka, invited him to speak to the students and all that. The principal took up the matter to locate his mark sheet in school and he found that he has got very poor marks. And this he said, he says in his book, unflinchingly, without any hesitation. I speak, I think that kind of uh, honesty I would like to see in, in any literature for that matter. And since we are talk talking about translation, I, the only language I can translate from is Oriya. I can't translate from your mother tongue, Bengali, or from any other language, not even Hindi for that matter, where I've lived. But uh, yes, at some point in time, I might come back. But they'll be on the side, not like this, which we went, went full-throated into it. Thank you. So we look forward to reading whatever comes next. And as I mentioned, copies of this book are available at the bookstore. So you can grab your copies, and I'm sure they'll be happy to sign them for you. Uh, now, if there are some questions from the audience, we would be uh, happy to take them. Uh, if anybody in the audience has some questions for uh, Sudeshna. In, in the sense of transparency, I'll only add uh, what Pratiti has mentioned. Any questions, no matter how embarrassing they are to us, if you are in a position to answer this, we will answer. If you are not, we will say that we are not just up to it. So please feel absolutely free to ask any questions, no matter how embarrassing they are to us. We won't be embarrassed. We have I think a question I'm shameless from uh, Barry O'Brien, who is here at the next session. He will be speaking about his book. Good afternoon. I, you've used the word transparency, sir, and honesty many times. And there are two words that are... Well, we don't hear the words, let alone see it happen. And you said you were a government clerk, very humbly you've put it, all your life. 
uh, how frustrating was it and I'll connect it to the translation also, how frustrating was it to work for the government and yet be restricted in how honest and transparent you can be and not honest but how transparent you can be definitely and how can you equate that to being a translator where you are actually feeling uh, confined within how, I mean you want to express yourself but actually you've got to express somebody else's uh, thoughts, views and words, uh, you know, and, and both of you are obviously creative people. So, I mean, I would never venture into translation because I'd just be, I'd just be, you know, sort of imposing myself on the writer. I think, uh, let me, let me just say that possibly you have divined my mind completely and literally you have provoked me to say something which I was avoiding because after all we are concentrating in this particular book. I will answer, we have just about 10 minutes. I will answer, I'll, I'll say what Sudeshna has written about my hesitation for her. I was the MRCT, my reluctant co-translator. So, I will use her words, what she has put it out. And to what extent we have been honest in this, you will get from this, at least a slice from this. We, instead of uh, the preface, we have mentioned about the way it happened, this particular book. There are two parts to it. And I will read out just the small note, what we have mentioned at the beginning. Quote, we are, from the book. We did not wish to read the off-beaten path, the preface, introduction, stories, acknowledgement continuum. We wanted to talk Turkey and say a few things that couldn't have been said otherwise, an account of how this anthology came together, how one of us took the first baby steps and asked the other to validate, how through the haze of doubt it gathered steam, how we came together and instead of attempting to translate eight, ten stories, decided to join together, to put together this anthology of 20 stories. In lieu of the preface, this is our apparative, our individual stories, before we get to the entree. Our translation knots, trajectories, fumbles, confessions, frank avowals, and averments are here. I'll go over to that part, what she quotes me exactly to answer your question. And that is uh, this. Uh, yeah, I will, I'll read out that one paragraph only. Uh, this, these are not my words, I'm quoting Sudeshna what she has put down in the book. One, two, three of four and a few more stories translated. Then one day I asked Sudanshu if he would care to join me. He generously agreed this, to this and, to be, and we became co-translators. Sudanshu is a writer who to use his own words, she has quoted my words within quote, feels translation shrinks creative spaces and puts lids on them. Even so, she has written, this reluctant translator is the wind behind the sails of this book. So, one of the reasons I had got out of translation is I didn't find the creative space that you talk about and I was kind of suffocated, you can say asphyxiated and I just went off it. Although that book was doing extremely well, very well re reviewed and received, it was possibly the first definitive translation of Oriya short stories on the 100th year of the publication of the first Odia short story. This was in 1998 and the 1998 and the first Odia short story had been written in 1898. But I went off and the reason is you have caught on and I think you, uh, you divine my mind. You could be a psycho analyst at least, if not a therapist. Thank you. 
We have another question here. Maybe the wind beneath the sails also S A L E S. <laughs> you have to. You do it for a friend of yours. And if I if I give a word to someone, I will keep it up. I junked my work. I just stopped that work for the last three years. It's not taken off. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Devashish. My question is to Sudeshna, madam. Uh, I'm in this uh, age of uh, where uh, books of late, like Bapa was translated. Uh, Bapa was used as such for a Odia movie. Uh, I'm not audible. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm audible. Okay. Uh, so I'll just start from before. Uh, my name is Devashi Sarangi, and uh, my question to you, ma'am, is uh, uh, like uh, Bapa was now made into a movie, Pratiksha. There could be some author who does not understand our language, uh, some writer, a director, who would want to have a translated version to, you know, understand uh, the uh, author and make a, uh, you know, a movie or a short documentary. So, would you be looking at translating any of uh, Gopinath Ji's novels or plays uh, in the near future, which could uh, probably be made into a movie? Who's, uh, who's, who's did you say? I didn't get novels? the names. Whose novels? I didn't get the names. Gopinath novels Mahanti. or plays. Novels or plays. Plays which would, would be made into a movie. Uh, yeah, could be a movie or some, uh, you know, uh, or to a play. But, uh, you know, the uh, director could be based somewhere uh, outside who would want a translated English version uh, to understand it better than, uh, you know, because he wouldn't uh, really understand the uh, nuances uh, through the uh, local language yeah so we have there are 20 there are 20 stories in this anthology so uh, that could be the base of any uh, non odia movie writer who would want to make a movie on this so and the script writing and that has to be done by someone else i could give them the basic story so the a movie maker would have to work around the story to make it screen ready He's asking, would you look at like a, doing a larger version, say maybe a novel or a play, which could then be used the by Most them. of Gopinath Mohanty's novels, uh, seven of his novels, have already, already been, been translated, translated into English. Right. So uh, his uh, notable novels, novels which, which would do well on the screen, have already been translated into English. So a short story also could be blown up to be made into a movie. That could also be tried. But then you will need a good scriptwriter for that. There's a question. Okay, we have a question there. Okay, sir, good afternoon. I'm Hemprabha Behra and I'm pursuing BA English on a such university. So my question is, how did you overcome from translating colloquial words and uh, what are the difficulties you have faced at that time as uh, some words are really difficult to translate? I, I think I'll answer in one word, lots. Lots, plenty. We were, uh, we were groping in the dark. I mean, both of us, and we have made it abundantly clear right at the beginning that our acquaintance with Odia was very little. I think she had next to nothing. She says this. Although I studied for a few years Odia in school and all that, I abandoned that in 1970, the moment I moved over to uh, college. And uh, I adapted my Pitru Vasa as also as my Matru Vasa. I think for the last 50 years, apart from what I mentioned about, I've never dabbled in this. And possibly, because when you, when you, when you live in a family where your daily conversation is sprinkled with English words, and more so, entirely English, when, you're, when your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law, they are nanorias, it's impol impolite on our part even to speak even a lick of Oriya before them, unless they understand, and they don't. I think uh, how we went uh, got around this is that there are many of the people who are here. I can, I can look at my brother-in-law, Dr. Bijay Ketan Patnaik, who is a writer in Oriya, who is the principal chief conservator of forest. And he was possibly one of the easiest person for me to reach out to. I mean, not for me, but Sudeshna, if at all we groped, she will just WhatsApp me, how about Bijay Vai? I immediately would flash it to him, ask him, and he would be ready with the answer. And not only the answer, which is just off the cuff, he would go back to the dictionary, he would even consult, because a lot of words are not only colloquial, it was colloquial, then it was patwa. So 
he would kind of excavate those words from those days by getting back to even uh, Madhusudan Rao's dictionary and all. And we also did, I also did download it and kept it on my telephone as well to see what exactly this could mean. And I think uh, being uh, ignorant is also a good thing. Not only bliss beyond this. And I say this because uh, the fact that we were ignorant and we were absolutely aware, every moment of our translating period, we were aware that we were ignorant. We would try to figure out going back to the etymology of the word from different ways. She had an advantage over me because she had a dictionary, I had none. But notwithstanding that, I think we did uh, try to, by banding it around, by asking a whole lot of people, like if you know about Daisy Rockwell, she collects a whole lot of information from her Twitter. A lot of readers, they would jump in and answer those questions for her. She's an American who knows Hindi like the back of her palm, uh, but she is an American basically. But nonetheless, she could understand not only translate that, but translate that most relevantly and appropriately, choosing the right words amongst the different synonyms. It was hard. Like I said, in one word, I'll say lots, plenty, but we got around that. Thank and you. as they have mentioned before, there are some words that they have kept in original as well to retain the local flavor. So some words from the original are also there in the translations. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, unlike Sudan Su, who is a near native speaker of English, I am not. Uh, so. <laughs> So what I, 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 my, I do not have a question actually, or so much of a question as much as uh, a reaction to what was happening in the past 45 minutes or 50 minutes, which kept me actually spellbound. So first of all, compliments to both who actually kept the audience spellbound with uh, whatever they said. But yeah, so others have joined. Thank you. Um, but the most important thing is, I think uh, Orissa in particular, I mean, I in particular and Orissa in general, ought to be expressing our gratitude and uh, appreciation to both the translators. Because as you, Pratiti, rightly said, Gopinath Mahanti is not very well known outside Orissa for the, uh, the short stories as much as uh, for his novels. Because the novels have been, uh, as he said, Sudhasana said, seven of his translations. Yes. But the, the short stories were not unknown. Quite a few short stories like ants have been translated into English, Russian and Italian and so on. So, but that's not just the only thing which I wanted to point out. I also, I would like to react to what you said. How did they maintain the or kept the, how, how did they translate the words or set the setting, the settings translation, which were written many, many years back. So herein, something strikes me, I thought I would share and that is, you know, the difference between the modernity and contemporariness. Oftentimes, we all take uh, contemporariness to be confused with modernity. But Tagore is as modern as he was 100 years back or 90 years back as he is today. And you just now listen to what, it, what they read out in Odia as well as in English. And these will never ever become old in that sense. So they will remain modern. That's one part. The other part is, out of these 150 short stories, quite a few have been translated, about 30. Most of them have been done by them. We would like to express our gratitude that <coughs> although the English translations of some of the short stories were available, this is the first time that a national publication of the short stories have come out through Penguin. So one second compliments to you. <coughs> and uh, one other thing about Gopinath Mahanti I wanted to share here, unlike what Sudhansu has said, you can't get those words in dictionaries. Gopinath Mahanti was learning Odia words, I want to emphasize. He was learning or picking up Odia words from the villages in Katak or in tribal areas where he spent. When these Odia words he was picking up and sometimes learning also from his wife, only to emphasize the fact that many of these words have actually evaporated. So he would like to pick them up, excavate, as uh, Sudan rightly said. So therefore, that uh, kind of urge in him to pick up Odia words also were there. And then finally, I think a small secret to be shared uh, since uh, uh, Sudeshna happens to be the daughter-in-law of Gopinath Mahanti, obviously therefore, <laughs> and incidentally, I am the eldest son of Gopinath Mahanti, but that is, that is not important. Important is 
Gopinath Mahanti's writings in prose, apart from fiction and prose, he wrote many, many things, translations into other languages and so on, and researches. Uh, the, the researches in the, in, into Uriya traditions and tribal traditions. Those of you who have read Amrita Santan and Paraja. So therefore... Can I, can I, can I just... Uh, uh, because we are... I think I, I'm, I'm stopped. I've stopped to, to now. I, so therefore, I wanted to I'll, once again I'll thank add, them I'll and just, appreciate. I'll just thank you. Thank I'll you so much, say sir. That one of the things that you'll find in this particular book is, and where I take a very different tack, to Mr. O'Brien's question, I always have said that he divined my mind. At least in the last 10 minutes I've been saying this. The one thing is that I have mentioned also in the translator's note, I've been upfront in saying things which none in Orissa have said, I'll say this. That eulogistic, panegyric, apotheosizing, writings and all that is not my cup of tea. I say that people let them slam me but at the same time, there's two sides of the coin. Let them whamm me with their suggestions and ideas. I take in both. We will not, I will not personally, I, if my father was writing in a regular, he was a writer, of course. If he were to write, I would say it is good. If it is not good, I will tell him to his face it is not good. It is not publishable also. I think there is an element of apostasization in this society. And unfortunately what has happened is, today my very dear friend from, for the last about 50 years, Arup Patnaik, he rang me up in the morning. He's present here also. And I've taken his permission to mention. I see there is a dialectic between the elite group and the non-elite, let me put it in a very generic way. And that is if at all the elite Elite group has literally hijacked the Oriya literature, literary scene, and which is any very, very unfortunate. And he was telling me about his own mama, who also happens to be Sivabrata Das, who happens to be the nephew of Kantakabi Lakshikant Mahapatra, the famous writer of Konamamu. In English also, my friend has translated Kamala Kant Mahapatra and Lilavati, they have translated to English one I uncle, he said that no one senior could stand that an inspector could write stories and he was moved around different places in back of the beyond of Orissa. And I have been telling and I don't know whether I shared this with Arup, I said that I am waiting for the day when a Manoranjan Biopari writes a book and those books are translated to English. I would I won't say that. To be very honest, since you mentioned, I am not in favor, I am never in favor of a family translation growing the way it has been growing. Even if it is very objective, it is always fraught with subjectivism. How much it is correct or incorrect, that's a different matter. Maybe oftentimes it could be incorrect. But the presumption of any reader is that I don't think in this particular book, we have said things what ought to be said. We have also said things which no one had said before in Orissa. The, uh, the literary, the glittering lit literature of Orissa. And to be very frank, I mean, you know, I, I keep saying that I am only a government clerk, former government clerk, nothing else. But no, 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 I, I, no, no, not the objectivity. I am saying that what happens is we generally ignore those kind of people who also have the same kind of inspiration, emotion, their amygdala I think is the same as ours, no different, except that they have not been captured and given out to the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to both Sudeshna and uh, Sudhanshu for joining us here today and for these translations as well. Uh, you can get your copies of the book at the bookstore. And uh, thank you, thank you both for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you, Pratipi. Thank you so much. Thank you.